Let's take our Bibles and we're in Mark chapter 15 this morning. Isn't it a blessing to go around our wonderful town and see all the flowers in bloom? And uh, the pretty uh, colors just looking out to our window. And, and of course we have a lot of rhododendrons in our yard and, and uh, they're just all starting to pop out and, and uh, be in bloom. And uh, probably be a good time of year to take a trip over to Shore Acres, wouldn't it? And uh, the uh, lots of big rhododendrons over there that uh, just surround that park, and and uh, so it's probably uh, uh, and the weather's been nice, so uh, that's always a uh, extra benefit and plus. Mark chapter fifteen, Mark chapter fifteen is we're going through the book of Mark, and and we come to Mark chapter fifteen. Uh, it's the last week of Christ's life. As he's uh, waiting to, uh, or not waiting, but as he's uh, spending the time there with his disciples and also uh, standing trial uh, publicly. Uh, well, now as he come towards the end of that, uh, that uh, time, as he's getting close to going to the cross, the Bible says, and, and just proceeding we had read, but uh, they uh, take him into captivity. And uh, there at the mount, as Judas betrays him with a kiss and and uh, they uh, take him for trial. And so now he's standing before the priests. And uh, in trials, we come to chapter 15 and then delivered to Pilate uh, to uh, be taken and, and uh, put to death. At this particular time, Israel uh, was under the authority of Rome. And, and, uh, and so the, uh, they did not have the authority themselves to carry out the death penalty. And uh, so he must be delivered to Rome uh, or the Romans to, uh, to judge and and so they 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 pass judgment and then they uh, give him over to the uh, Romans to judge and and with the accusations against him and uh, that uh, he might be put to death. And and so here in Mark chapter 15, verse one, the Bible says and straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner whom they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude of crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them so they're at that feast they say you always deliver you give pardon to one of the prisoners and 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 so they began to uh, ask him to do that verse number nine Pilate seeing his opportunity the bible says but Pilate answered them saying will ye that i release unto you the king of the jews for he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy and so this is the opportunity for the people to get jesus released the the uh, priests had, try, had, had tried him. They had accused him. They delivered him to Pilate for judgment. And, and uh, so he sees the opportunity now. He says, well, the priests are against him. Uh, and, uh, and they've done this out of envy. And so, but the people love him. Uh, I mean, you read in, in uh, Matthew 21, as he came in, they heralded him as the king, as the Messiah. They welcomed him like a king putting the palm leaves before him, which is a symbol of royalty, and, and throwing their garments down before him, showing their uh, submission and obedience to him as he came into Jerusalem just three days before this. And, and so, uh, so uh, Pilate, he uh, sees the opportunity to be able to get uh, Jesus freed. And, and, uh, and so he, uh, he says, uh, uh, you know, uh, you always deliver one of those, so you don't give a pardon and and uh, of course, they probably had their uh, their uh, favorites or, uh, you know, those that they, uh, you know, uh, would would uh, desire to be pardoned. Maybe some with family members there or uh, others that were in prison. And 
and uh, uh, it wasn't like that there was only a couple in prison. We know that there was at least four in prison, but uh, many more. And and uh, and so uh, so again, they'd make petition for and and, uh, you know, that one that he would deliver. And and uh, and so he's, uh, you know, uh, well, OK, what about Jesus? Uh, you know, uh, here it says, what about, uh, you know, the king of the Jews? Uh, he'd be a good one to release unto you. And uh, verse 11, but the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Uh, take the least guilty and says, no, we want the most guilty. Uh, the murderer would rather have a murderer than Jesus Christ. You know, that must have hurt the Lord. Uh, how much that he loves uh, you and I. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. And uh, yet they would rather have the, the worst, most despised criminal released uh, than the Lord. That, that's like a slap in the face. Uh, and how it must have hurt uh, to uh, see that take place. But uh, the people, uh, they, uh, they're they moved by the chief priests. And uh, verse 12, And Pilate answered and said again unto them, what will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. Follow the message this morning. What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews. What will you then that I shall do unto him you call, that you call, which you call the king of the Jews? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to come and fellowship together. Lord, to be able to sing and praise uh, your name. And, and uh, we, we've sang the, uh, the, uh, the songs that uh, were picked this morning and just uh, praise the Lord that, uh, God, you don't change. Uh, we, we can trust in you to be the same uh, today as you were yesterday and as you will be tomorrow. Uh, Lord, that uh, you never get older. Uh, Lord, that you never uh, lack strength. Uh, that, Lord, you never lack ability. That, uh, that you're eternal. And, uh, Father, you're perfect in the beginning and you'll be perfect in the end. Uh, Father, I thank you that your love for us in the beginning will be the, the, that love in the end regardless of what we do or what takes place and uh, in the time in between. And, Father, I pray that you would bless the message this morning. And, and Lord, just uh, uh, I pray we'd have the faithfulness to you that you have to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we look at uh, what will you then do? You know, it's amazing to me how, how easily it was for the priests to change the heart of the people. Uh, Jesus Christ came in and they were all there to welcome and to herald him as a king as he came in. And, uh, and the Bible says here, the priests, they, uh, they did deliver him up because of envy, because people were starting to follow him rather than them. And so very easily they were able to take the whole crowd and, and, uh, to, uh, change their heart to, uh, to get them to, uh, to yell, crucify him to the one whom they were just praising as he came in and, and uh, to, to note here, uh, you know, the the uh, the passage uh, over and over, it's repeated in this particular passage, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. In fact, uh, Pilate questions him, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, thou sayest it. He goes on and and uh, here he, he says in verse number nine, Paul, Pilate calls him the king of the Jews. So he acknowledges that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. In verse number nine, he says, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And then, of course, it goes on. He gives testimony because he heard as Christ came into Jerusalem. They all heralded him as the king. And and so uh, so he gives testimony. He says, what will you then that I shall do unto him whom ye call? King of the Jews. Whom ye call king of the Jews. He's heard them call him their king. What will you do? reading a, a book about a fighter pilot and uh, in uh, one particular uh, scene he's uh, just out uh, parting it up with his friends and talking about the babes the term that they use the babes uh, 
Well, the next scene, he's in a, a fight in the air. The enemy's hot on his tails during the Vietnam War, and, and uh, uh, he's, he's sure that uh, he's going to be shot down. And he begins to pray and ask the Lord to save him uh, from being shot down. And it's amazing, but uh, all of a sudden another plane appears uh, there out, you can say out of the blue, and uh, saves him, and shoots down the enemy. And so then the following scene, uh, he's back out with his buddies again, uh, and uh, he's uh, getting wiped out drunk. And you know, he presents himself as a believer. That's modern Christianity, by the way. You can find it everywhere. Uh, it will surprise you, the, the people that will say that they're Christians. And you ask them to say, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. And you can go out and talk to them about their testimony. There's so many people that give a clear testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that they are saved. There was a time and a place that they confessed Christ as their Savior. Wouldn't it be something if Jesus was committed to us like we're committed to him? Boy, that'd be a scary thought, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I praise the Lord that salvation is not by works. Uh, and uh, it's not your good works that keep you saved because we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Uh, anybody, anybody ever after you got saved uh, let the Lord down? Uh, and uh, uh, to, to be able to, uh, I praise the Lord that he, he's committed to us to the uttermost, isn't he? The day you trusted Christ as your Savior and and he, he committed himself. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I thank the Lord that he does not change. He's just as committed to you today as he was the day you saved you. In fact, he was committed before he saved you. Uh, in his love for you. That he sent his son to die for you. But he's committed to save you to the uttermost. The, the moment you trusted Christ as your savior. Uh, if you uh, have never trusted Christ as your Savior, I, uh, I would pray you to trust Christ today, uh, to know Christ as your Savior, to, uh, to know that, uh, listen, he will commit himself to you to the uttermost. It doesn't matter uh, how ugly you become in your life. He will still be committed to you. He's not a fair weather friend. Uh, and uh, he's not just going to love you when you're lovely. He loved you before you were lovely. The Bible says God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you even when you were in the midst of all of your sin, maybe even cursing him. Uh, many people can look back to a time they cursed God. They ignored him. They denied him. And yet he was still committed to draw you. And when you called upon him, he saved you and he saved you to the uttermost. Where is the commitment from Christians today? Are we like the crowd here that so easily they can go from calling him king to yelling crucify him? And uh, so, so easily swayed by the, the priests. I read this. This was, this was last year, but it was a, a news article. Uh, took place in Austria. And uh, I, I'm sure I got the names wrong, but the pronunciation, Cronin Zetung newspaper, something like that. Uh, anyway, I don't, uh, didn't look up the phonetics on how to pronounce. But anyway, it's a newspaper in Austria wrote, they just reported the following story. Uh, a man was taken to court by an old girlfriend for bigamy. Eleven years after they were married, on a whim, in a Las Vegas chapel. And uh, the account says that back in 2004 that the, the couple on a date, they, they flew to uh, Las Vegas. And uh, while they're out on the town, they went by a wedding chapel and uh, decided, well, let's, let's go ahead and get married. And uh, they uh, did. In fact, the testimony says that the man says it only cost me 25 bucks. There was a reverend who asked us the only question, do you believe in God? That's it, said the man. Neither of them took the ceremony seriously at the time. 
Their relationship broke up a short time later. Now he's 55 years old in Austria. And uh, he's met the woman of his dreams and he wants to get married. So he goes down and gets a marriage license and he gets married in Austria. Austria. Uh, well, this, this girl hears about it. And so she lets the authorities know, uh, listen, he can't marry her or we're married. We were married 11 years ago in Las Vegas. Well, it's got to go to court. So it's all presented before the judge. And and uh, says when the judge asked the man why he didn't mention the Vegas wedding in the registration process, he said, I felt that I was not married. I didn't think that that ceremony in Vegas had legally had legal validity in Austria. Because that's that's America. That's a different country. And how can that wedding have legal? Uh, well, he had to pay a fine of five thousand euros for bigamy. Uh, there in, in Austria, a fine that took place. Uh, say what commitment? You know, I wonder how many people that that was their commitment to Christ when they got saved. A Las Vegas wedding on a whim. Sounds good. Okay, I'll say a prayer and ask Christ to be my Savior. Uh, you know, the truth of it is, if you meant it from your heart and you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you got saved. You got saved. And he committed himself to you for all eternity. He committed to be your Savior. He took all of your sins upon him. Uh, your guilt and your shame, and he, he died for that. He adopted you. God adopted you as his son or daughter, and it is for all eternity he committed himself to you. But you know, as people, we can be kind of fickle, can't we? That's the word that came to mind was fickle when I was thinking of uh, that fighter pilot and his supposed belief in God. Uh, modern Christianity, kind of fickle. Inconsistent. You know, I looked up uh, synonyms of that word fickle uh, and a, a word that just kind of stood out, vacillating. Vacillating. That's not a term we use too often, is it? The Bible talks about that kind of faith when you go and ask for God for wisdom and it says, but nothing wavering. Otherwise, you're like the waves of the sea. You're just kind of tossed to and fro. Uh, the Bible says of, of uh, you know, uh, those who are not discipled and and. Uh, go on to grow in the Lord that uh, they're carried about with every wind of doctrine. I picture that here in, in the book of Mark as as they'll, they'll herald him as the king of the Jews. And then uh, a few days later, uh, they'll listen to the priests and, and sway them. All of a sudden they're saying, crucify him. Uh, give us the worst of the criminals in his place and let him free in our streets and and uh, let uh, let uh, Christ who's done no wrong. I find no fault in him, Pilate said. And uh, uh, let him be crucified. All because the Pharisees told him to. Uh, how quickly, how easily it is to forsake the Lord who will never forsake you or I. Uh, how quick that we can change. Vacillating. Abraham, the friend of God. God said this of him in Genesis eighteen nineteen. He said, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Now, Abraham had a good testimony. Uh, God said, I know that he's going to be committed. I know that he's going to be committed. God had a blessing upon Abraham and and because of that, a whole nation, uh, actually nations came into being. Uh, through Abraham and uh, of course the promised seed the Lord Jesus Christ came through the the line of Abraham and and uh, why it was because of of uh, their God's uh, God's choosing but it was because of Abraham's faith his commitment uh, to God he says I know him that he's going to keep my ways he's going to command his children after me he's going to bring them up in the nursery admonition of the Lord and he's going to keep my ways uh, I'm committed to him, but he's also committed to me. Look at Joshua chapter 24 in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 24. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Joshua. 
Joshua chapter 24. Brother James has been teaching us or trying to get us to memorize anyway the Bible, books of the Bible uh, during Sunday school opening. And uh, trying to teach us a song. We're not being very successful at that song, by the way. Or at least I'm not being. Uh, you might be. But uh have to keep working on that. Learn the books of the Bible. But here in Joshua, chapter number 24, last, last chapter of the book of Joshua. Joshua, chapter 24. The Bible says in verse number 14, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. Serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Revelations, it talks about the last church age, the last period of the church. And he says, talk about lukewarmness. He said, I would, you'd rather cold or hot. He says, choose you this day whom you'll serve. If not God, then choose who you're going to serve, but make a choice. Choose whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered in verse 16. We're in Joshua 24, verse 16. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. I hope that that's your testimony. God forbid that we would forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. God's been faithful to us. We're going to be faithful to him. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And uh, I praise the Lord for New Testament grace. Amen. It's actually not just New Testament grace. It's grace all the way through. Uh, if God was to, to do what he could do, uh, Joshua tries to, to let him know, are you sure? Uh, are you sure you're going to be faithful to the Lord, serve the Lord? Uh, well, notice the end of the chapter. Verse 31. Joshua 24, verse 31. Joshua, the book of Joshua. Joshua's in the Old Testament, the fifth book or the sixth book. Last chapter, twenty four, verse thirty one. The Bible says, and is and Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel it is possible to be faithful to God it is possible the Bible says that Joshua kept that commitment didn't he not only did Joshua but those elders that swore that commitment they kept it too uh, now, their children did not carry it on, but for all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived him, that lived longer than he did, they kept it. They stayed faithful to God. Uh, you come to the book of Judges, and vacillating becomes a, a good term for it. Uh, they make the commitment. They, for a few years, follow it, and then they go against it. And 
and uh, they get in trouble again and they cry out to God and they make the commitment again and then they uh, they, they change and they go away from it and and uh, but uh, we, we find in Joshua's day Joshua he, he made and kept the commitment and you say yeah but Joshua he was a superhuman uh, no actually we have more power to keep the commitment today than Joshua had we have the indwelling Holy Spirit and uh, and so uh, as we think of, of that commitment as for me and my house we will serve the Lord I'm not a good testimony of this passage I got saved when I was seven years old and I uh, made a public statement of faith I followed the Lord in baptism I didn't follow the Lord all through my youth growing up my teenage years it wasn't until I was 20 years old that I rededicated my life to the Lord and I renewed that commitment that I had made uh, you know when you trust Christ as your Savior he commits himself to you for all eternity it should be easy for us to commit ourselves to him uh, he's worthy we're not and God says that in the Bible the testimony of Christians and Jesus Christ himself gave the testimony but uh, if you're serious about following the Lord, then show it publicly. Make a public commitment. Get baptized. You know, baptism is that ceremony of public commitment. That's the, the wedding ceremony, if you would. Uh, the wedding ring of the ceremony. It says, if you're serious about following the Lord Jesus Christ, then publicly commit it. Uh, there in the baptismal waters, as you go down into the water, the Bible says that your old man is dying, and as you come back up out of the water, that you're getting resurrected to walk in the newness of life. You're publicly making a commitment. Christ, you are my Savior, and I'm going to follow you. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. And you make that commitment to follow Christ. But the only term I can think about myself is, and I can use excuses, well, I was just a seven-year-old boy. Uh, you know, we can all make excuses, can't we? Excuses don't hold you accountable, though, do they? Uh, we make that statement of faith. I, I'm, I, I'm going to commit myself to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet how, how quickly many forsake that commitment uh, I praise the Lord that God's faithfulness to us is not like our faithfulness to him look at Ruth chapter 1 Ruth the lady Ruth R-U-T-H just two more books past Joshua. Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. Here in Ruth chapter 1, verse number 15. 1, chapter 1, verse 15. Now, Ruth, she was a Moabitess. She was a Gentile, if you would. Not a, a Jew, but a Gentile. And, and uh, yet she, she married a Jew. And he, he died. Uh, well, actually, his father died, and his brother died, and he died. And so Ruth was left a widow. Uh, her mother-in-law and her and her sister heading back home to Israel. And her mother-in-law frees her and says, you, you, you don't have to keep any commitment to me and worry about taking care of me. You can go back to your people. And I really have nothing to offer you. I don't have another son to give you. And there's not much hope. I mean, we're going to, back to Israel. And, and uh, you know, amongst Jewish people, it's, it's not much of a, a chance of you finding a husband. And, and uh, so you're going to spend your, uh, your life single and you can go back to your people. And, and here in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, and she said, 
Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. And uh, we find here the great-grandma of King David, uh, Ruth. She kept that commitment. She went on to serve the God of Israel, the one true God, and to be faithful. God blessed in her life and uh, was able to use her. You know, we hear that, you know, the, the, the statement actually comes from the Bible, but, uh, you know, the statement that women can change their mind, men can't. You know, actually that is, uh, you know, a biblical the Bible says that a woman can make a promise, and if her husband, uh, her husband, if, if the f at first he hears that promise she has made, he has a, ri a, a right uh, to uh, break that promise and to say, no, you're not making that promise. Uh, and, uh, and so you, you could, you know, uh, say that a woman can change her mind uh, or uh, her husband change it or, uh, you know, whichever. A daughter. Uh, the first time that her dad hears that she's made that promise, he can say, no, you're not making that promise. And, and uh, that promise is null and void, biblically. And, uh, but women can be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can keep that commitment. Uh, the Bible says in that testimony of Ruth, and there's many other ladies in the Bible that were faithful that kept a commitment to God. I've shared just because it's, unfortunately, it's true, but it's funny. Not when I tell it, of course, because when I tell jokes, they're not funny. But three preachers in those old buildings with the high steeples and all that. And, and anyway, you've heard the account. They all got bat problems. And so uh, the one preacher, he, he said, uh, you know, I uh, tried to get rid of those bats, and I just can't get rid of them. And. He said, what'd you try? And he says, well, I tried to shoot him with a shotgun. Because, you know, bats, they, they, you need a big scatter in order to hit them because they're, they're, they're pretty good about, uh, uh, you know, uh, with their radar and everything else. But uh, anyway, and, and uh, that didn't do anything except for have to patch the roof. And uh, the other uh, preacher says, well, you know what I did? I, I uh, was able to, uh, you know, get some people together and we caught them all. And we took them on a road trip. And we let them loose. But that didn't help. Those bats came right back again. You know, the third preacher says, well, I got rid of all my bats. And he said, what'd you do? I baptized them. Now, it's funny, but it's not. How many times somebody will get saved and they get all excited about the Lord and they, they come and they follow the Lord in baptism and then, I'll see you when I get to heaven. And uh, the life of a, a Christian isn't very long. And I, I believe Christians that when they, they, they come to the altar and confess Christ as their Savior are sincere. It's amazing how sincere we can be about something today and not sincere about it tomorrow. Our commitment just isn't very long, is it? What uh, would cause us to uh, not be committed to the Lord? Look at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 8 in the New Testament. It's hard to believe that those that heralded him as king as he came into Jerusalem that they weren't sincere. I mean, they... They sure appear to be sincere. They were definitely excited about it. They were willing to, you know, and, and it wasn't like you had uh, goodwill to go to today. Uh, you know, they had one change of garments. Maybe that was it. And they were willing to throw those garments down before uh, that uh, mule as, as Christ rode in uh, there and, and uh, have it trampled uh, there in, into the dust. And, and uh, they uh, would uh, had no shame about proclaiming him and, and uh, shouting and, and uh, what their neighbors thought. And so they sure seem sincere. But how quickly they 
uh, they changed. It's amazing. God loves us. It'd be easy for God to say, well, they're not committed to me. I'm not committed to them. But actually, it wouldn't be easy because when God makes a commitment, it's for eternity. He's committed to you whether you're committed to him or not. If you've sincerely trusted Christ as your savior. Here in Mark chapter eight, verse thirty one. The Bible says here in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed after three days rise again. And he spake the saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it. And by the way, that doesn't mean you have to die. He's talking about it being a living sacrifice. In other words, you give up. You've, you've heard that statement, get a life. Well, Jesus says, give up a life. You surrender yourself to him and you say, it's no longer my life. But God, what do you want to do with my life? He's talking about a complete commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says when you do that, you, you, you don't lose your life, even though you gave it up. You actually save it. You're going to get to see and hear and do and be a part of and experience a joy that you cannot get from this world and from getting a life. It's through giving. Verse 36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I, I believe that there is a blessing from commitment. When we have a, a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. People just have no commitment today. Have you heard people say that before? People just don't have any commitment today. You know, I, I thought about that and said, well, maybe it's just our generation. Maybe it's just America. People just aren't committed today. I've seen men that will get up before dark, I mean, before, before light. Five, six days a week. Not feeling good. Aching bodies. Drag themselves out of bed. Sometimes not even time to eat breakfast. And go out and get in their pickup. And drive off to work. And work all day, sometimes long hours. Drag themselves back to that pickup and drag themselves back home again. Five days a week, 20 or 30 years. And they struggle to make it to church three times a week. I don't think it's a problem with commitment. I think people got commitment in America. We have commitment, don't we? You see it. What would cause a man to... Now I understand there's a lot of our youth have no commitment at all. It's not a problem with finding a job. It's uh, Employers tell me it's a problem with finding employees who will do the job. So with some, there is a, a lack of commitment, but I've seen many committed. Men that will get up on their day off before light... In the winter, freezing cold outside, and they'll grab their fishing pole. And they'll put it in the pickup, and they'll go out there, and, and uh, why, I've been one of them. 
Stand on that river bank, feet freezing. Boy, your hands, you can't even feel, you know, because they're so cold. It even gets so cold sometimes you've got to break the ice off the pole because the line won't go through the eyes. It gets so cold. To catch a steel hit. But to get him to go out soul winning. It's either too wet. It's too early. It's too late. Uh, I don't know. It's too something. It's not a problem with commitment, is it? Commitment can't be the problem because it's the same, same man. The commitment's there. I've seen people that will sign a contract to buy a house and for 30 years they'll faithfully make that payment. And they'll pay that electric bill and they'll pay uh, and uh, talk about the credit. I mean, they are committed. But to give God the tithe, <laughs> just can't do that. Just can't do that. Again, I, I question, maybe it's not the commitment. We've got a lot of commitments, and you say, I, just, I just don't want another commitment. Just don't want another commitment. What is it? I've seen parents that will sacrifice their weekends, sometimes travel distances with expense to faithfully support their kids and watch them in sports. But they can't seem time to find time to serve the Lord. By the way, all those are good commitments. Uh, it's good to be faithful at work. Uh, you need to have hobbies, don't you? And if you're going to have a hobby, it takes some commitment. Uh, in order to be able to accomplish it. They keep telling me, with fishing anyway, Brother Bob says you've got to put in your time, right? Uh, Brother Bob doesn't say that, but uh, remember... Uh, uh, brother uh, uh, Lauren used to say that and uh, he got to where he had trouble getting out of the boat and stuff and so his his uh, wife was just worried about him and so he'd have, she'd, she she picked me to, to be the one to uh, you know to uh, make sure he went out and came back safely so I'd go out and you know ride in the boat with him and, and uh, try to, to catch a salmon and he'd just keep telling me because we'd come back time after time and no fish he'd say you just got to put in your time you just got to put in your time it takes commitment doesn't it nothing wrong that, that's good it was good fellowship and and, uh, of course, uh, did catch a couple of salmon. It's pretty exciting uh, when you catch those. But uh, nothing wrong with that kind of a commitment. Certainly not a bad uh, commitment to make to pay your bills and pay them on time. Uh, it's not a, a, a problem. We need, to, we need to support our kids, don't we? Isn't that what God, you know, that's part of, of raising kids. And, and uh, just a, it's, it's, it's a blessing to see. And some of those memories and things that are built through those things. Uh, so maybe it's not a problem with commitment. But it could be a problem with who's king. Who's king? Several times there in Mark, he says, uh, are you the king of the Jews? He goes on and he says, you are. He says, he is the king of the Jews. And then he, he says, what shall I do with him whom ye call? Recognize the crowd referred to him as king of the Jews. Is Christ king? I, I, I would expect most people here that are if you're saved, you'd probably say, yes, Christ is king. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. He's my savior. He's committed to me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. But how's your commitment to him? Luke six, the Bible says, and why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. And he goes on and gives great promise and also great warning. He says, whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man that built his house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream bed beat vehemently upon the house and, uh, and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. 
And he goes on to say, but those who hear his word and do not obey them. Uh, it's like that house built on the sand. You know, the storms come and the rains and, and that house tumbles down. Um, is he king? I believe it's a daily commitment, but uh, if you think about it in your life, there's some things you're committed to. Uh, in fact, at great sacrifice, uh, you will keep those commitments. But when it comes to the Lord, why aren't we as committed or more committed to the Lord Jesus Christ as we are to those other things? It's not wrong to have commitments. You need to be committed to your commitments. But somewhere along, we we think less of our commitments to the Lord than we do our commitments to everything else in life. When it should be, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's stand as we have the invitation this morning. I have found myself and may find myself there again like this crowd. Today I can determine I choose to follow him. But how committed am I? You know that anytime you make a commitment, the devil's going to challenge that commitment when it comes to the Lord. He'll give you all the excuses you need to back out of it or not keep it. About the time you say, I'm going to go soul winning today, it's going to pour down rain, isn't it? That's Oregon. Some places it might snow, but are you committed to him? If you're not saved, how can you pass up the opportunity to have God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, be committed to you for all eternity? Regardless of what takes place in my life, I know he's my savior and I'll be in heaven one day. But I need to be committed to him. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this morning. I thank you, Father, for the message. And uh, Lord, sometimes it's uh, easy to put into words and to say it, but can we live it? Lord, in my heart, I, I'm committed to you today. But Lord, will I keep that commitment? Will I be committed 15 minutes down the road? When the devil begins to try it. Father I. Uh, I'm sorry that. You have such a vacillating people to work with. I pray Lord that. You'd help me to be faithful to you. Because you're so faithful to me. I pray Father you bless this invitation time. Lord as your Holy Spirit is a work in our hearts. It's a good time to recommit. Father, there's some that aren't saved that are here today that need your son as their savior. And Lord, if they could know how much you love them and how committed you are to them, that you would even send your own son to die for them because you love them so much. If they today would just bend their knee, and bow their head and ask you to be their savior. Lord, I believe you'd save them. I ask, Lord, that you just bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.